Let's talk about how white women use their tears to defend their racism. I have been a victim of white women's tears on more than one occasion, and I feel very strongly about it and would like to talk about it and elaborate on it. Mm, it's uncomfortable, not gonna lie. And maybe 10, 15 years ago, I would have said, but that's just as racist. However, I am really lucky that over the last 10, 15 years, I have experienced other cultures and seen things from a different angle. Getting upset is a perfectly valid emotion. If I was accused of racism, I'd probably cry. Maybe because I'm fragile. The problem is, historically, white women take it a step further. They then utilize their tears so that they can play the victim is a weapon. White women crying when they receive any sort of criticism from women of color is fucking racist because white women will sit there and use their tears as weapons against women of color to absolve themselves from any sort of guilt, but also to silence women of color. Hello, my good people. Welcome back again our youtube channel and of course it's a wonderful morning it is 6 30 a.m here in africa and i thank god for the new day guys i've come across some video here of uh, white women and uh, i want to ask some question that uh, will gonna drive us into a serious discussion concerning this uh, behavior that white women are having is it true that uh, white women uses their tears as a weapon to punish our black women I'm told that uh, they can do wrong, but uh, once they cry, shed tears, they will automatically receive sympathy from the people around. And uh, they normally act victims, even if they are the ones who are wrong. And uh, they have caused many problems to black people, like they've made our people lose their jobs for no reason. And uh, they've also made our people to lose any opportunities, for some serious opportunities just because of the tears that they are shedding to deceive the people around to come to their defense. They are aware that their tears is a weapon and they are using it accordingly. Here are some rational videos from both palm colored people and the people of color. And let's see if it is true that white women uses their tears as a weapon to punish our black women, even if the other people were wrong, the people will automatically agree just because the white woman has shed her tears. Let's see what people say about this. Let's see what people say about this. And if you are here for the first time, please hit that subscription button and uh, like this video. And uh, you can as well join our membership because we want people to join our membership for us to build a stronger community together. I want to wish you well, guys. And let's dive in, watch these videos then come back and discuss this topic. Let's talk about how white women use their tears to defend their racism. So London and Olivia are a pretty like, popular couple here on TikTok. They just got married and London made a lot of racist tweets about 10 years ago and they surfaced right after they got married. London decided to make a 10 minute long apology and it is the classic case study of how white women apologize when they are called out for being racist. So we have to understand white privilege in this scenario. White people, we get to toggle on and off our identities, okay? So we get to be part of the white community when it benefits us, and we get to separate ourselves from the white community when it does not benefit us. And we can go into self mode. Now, people in Biopac do not get to do that at all. This is what London does, right? So starting with her denial of what happened. It wasn't her who made those racist remarks. It was the community in which she was brought up in. It was her friends. They all encouraged each other to do racist things. Not her. It was just her community, right? Denial of her actions. This 100% contributes to systemic racism, by the way. Okay, then we move into rationalization. Well, you see, it was normal. It was normal in my community to be racist, which is why I was racist. Again, not her. She's not racist. It's the community that was racist. She's rationalizing her racist comments because that's the community in which she was raised in. Okay, so now she's going to start toggling on herself again. She's going to start separating herself from the white community and we're going to go into false envy. This is when she oversimplifies her actions, right? She didn't realize that these were bad words, right? Like now she understands that these were bad words as if some point these were good words. She now gets to decide what are good and bad words and the use of them, even though it's not her community 
at all that should be using these words ever, right? She is not the one that should be setting the standards of humanity for a community that is not her own, but she is because that's what white people get to do, right? We get to set the standards of humanity by which we succeed. So we're going into false envy. She now kind of understands like the black community and why she shouldn't have used those words. And then we get into benevolence, which is, well, now I'm a good person. Now I fully understand. I know people of color now. So therefore I know to never use those words again. And this is when people feel bad for her and say, oh, you didn't know any better. You were just 16. How would you know that that was racist? You poor thing. We forgive you. And that's how we perpetuate systemic racism as white people. So today I was casually scrolling through Instagram and I came across a post that talked about the concept of white women tears and why they are so detrimental and dangerous to people of color and black women in particular. And as somebody who is a black woman and grew up going to school in predominantly white institutions in a predominantly white society, I have been a victim of white women's tears on more than one occasion and I feel very strongly about it and would like to talk about it and elaborate on it. So for context, what are white women tears? White women tears refer to the concept of white women using their tears, their distress, or their anger to absolve themselves of guilt, responsibility, or accountability, and also simultaneously in the process, vilify and um, punish a person of color, particularly more often than not a black woman. And this phenomenon of white women tears is so dangerous because white women tend to be very hyper feminized in our society. They are seen as delicate, really feminine damsel in distresses that are in need of being cared for, protected, and rescued. While black women are typically hyper masculinized and labeled as aggressive, defensive and unpleasant and um, generally just argumentative. So what typically happens in situations where a woman weaponizes her tears is that she'll typically go out of her way to make life unbearable for the black woman in some way, whether it's through a one-off or a series of events where she is harassing, she's bullying, she's being racist, she's ostracizing a black woman and making her feel generally intimidated, accepted or unwelcomed or just being outright blatantly disrespectful. And when the black woman decides to respond accordingly to the disrespect of this white woman, the white woman instantly flips the script by turning on the waterworks and crying and causing a scene and acting like she's the victim and people will instantly rush to her aid to comfort her and help her. Which now makes it look like she is the victim and the black woman was the one who is now responsible for reducing her to tears, even though that is clearly not the case. And it's so particularly dangerous and detrimental because what happens is that now the black woman in the situation ends up taking the blame for something that she did not do. Or when the black woman was actually the victim, just simply turning on the waterworks and crying now instantly turned her to the villain or the bully. And white woman tears can range from the severity of just being a nuisance and a wrench in a black woman's day to costing her her life. Black women have been unfairly and unnecessarily punished, fired from their jobs, lost out on um, opportunities or leadership roles, and even in really lethal cases, have even been killed because of the tears of a white woman. And it is so particularly sinister because typically when this happens, it's not like the white woman is just um, rightfully getting upset and in the process, she unintentionally draws a crowd who then go ahead to vilify and reprimand the black woman for doing such to her. No, that's not what typically happens. What happens more often than not is that these white women are very, very aware of the power that their tears hold and what they can get out of it and also what it can cause other people. So them turning on the waterworks and flipping the script is usually never unintentional. They know exactly what they're doing and they know exactly what they're going to get out of it. And that is what really, really scares me the most. They know the power that their tears hold and they know that when push comes to shove, they are fully aware of how people view and look at black women. They already know that when it comes down to it, they are already going to label the black woman as the aggressor and the one who is responsible for her tears. They know that nobody is interested in hearing the black woman's side or standing up for her and defending her and they use that to their advantage to gain a more favorable outcome for themselves. I'm going to tell a brief story of something that happened to me while I was in my sophomore year of high school and how a white girl looking for my trouble unprovoked not once but twice and me standing on business and deciding to defend myself and reprimand her ended up with the script being flipped and her being absolved of any responsibility or accountability and me being punished. So I had a particularly troubling situation where I was going home on the bus one day, minding my business, listening to music, and this white guy decides to, unprovoked out of nowhere, 
come and put his hand in my afro puff cliff extension because i had a slick up bun that i decided to give some more fullness by clipping on an afro puff to it he knew that it was not my real hair and decided to make a joke by coming up to me unprovoked while i was minding my business and unsuspecting and yanking it off in front of my head for everybody to see in front of the bus as a joke now obviously me being mortified and obviously angry that this happens i immediately get up i get in his face and i start fighting and we're gonna call this white girl Lisa. So what Lisa does is that Lisa gets up and comes to the white boy's defense and tells me to go sit down and to calm down and that it was just a joke and that if I don't, she's gonna beat me up as per get physical with me. Now, everybody in the bus is also super shocked, but nobody's coming to my defense. And at this point, the white guy is also still fighting me and there's another black guy behind them that is also getting on my case and telling me to go sit down and calm down. So at this point, it's almost four against one and nobody's coming to my defense. So I just collect my Afro puff, grumble, go sit down on the other side of the bus and mind my business for the duration of the bus ride. Taken, I did not report them. I did not call anybody, not go to the teachers, nothing about this. So a few days later, um, I have a class with this girl. So she was taking an intro level course, even though she was in grade 12 and I was in grade 10. So we had somehow managed to end up in the same class. And there was a conversation going on amongst a group of people about a mutual friend of ours, we'll call her Sammy. And the story was that apparently Sammy's boyfriend had bought her a spicy toy and everybody was weighing in their opinions and talking about the situation. Now I had a big old biology textbook in front of me. I was trying to study for a test and I had chimed in about the situation once or twice, but I more or less did not say anything more than that. I was more focused on trying to study. And I had noticed that at some point Lisa had come into the room and she was kind of scanning around, listening around, but I didn't really pay much attention to her because I already was not in a good place with her after what had happened the previous week. But then about 15 minutes later, I see our assistant principal hovering outside the door and she comes in and she beckons me to come out into the hallway and have a word with her. And at this point, I'm confused because I have not been involved in anything. I have not done anything, at least not to my knowledge. So I was kind of confused about what this was about. And our assistant principal, who I thought I had a very good relationship at the time because I had spoken to her numerous times about things that I was also going through, had called me onto the hallway and started to calmly but sternly reprimand me about having an inappropriate conversation of that nature about another student while they were not present and in an educational environment. Now, while I was not particularly upset about being held accountable for my actions because I did participate in the conversation to a degree, even though I only chimed in briefly once or two times, what really angered me was the fact that there was multiple people who were also a part of this conversation, but I was the only person who was singled out, brought out of the classroom and reprimanded for engaging in such. And I obviously immediately knew that Lisa had something to do with it based on the way she was, you know, snaking around the classroom, listening, and also she was looking at me. Now, I did not say anything or do anything to my assistant principal, but I was immediately livid. And when I got home, I got on Snapchat, sat on my desk and made a one minute video that I posted to my private story, ranting about this girl, insulting her, calling her badly built, asking her why she was looking for problems with the 10th grader while she was in seventh grade, you know, all these things, all these things. I was just really going in on her. Keep in mind, I did not have Lisa on any social medias. I did not tag her or mention her by name, any of that. But somehow this information had gotten back to her and the following day after that i had a field trip for my science class and i was off school grounds all day but when i came back i noticed that people were coming at me they were like oh rhoda what's the problem with lisa i heard that you and lisa are gonna fight what's going on and i was like i don't know what lisa's problem is but i'm not engaging with this and i had completely forgotten about the video that i posted on snapchat the night before and everybody was waiting for me to get on the bus to go start a problem with lisa because they were looking for some entertainment and i wasn't feeding into it i decided to take another bus and mind my business going home I saw on my phone that I had missed a call from my mother while I was on the field trip, so I called her back and I told her, hey mom, I'm gonna be home from school in about 30 minutes. And my mom cuts me off mid-sentence and she angrily goes, do you know you've been suspended from school? And I'm just like, what, what for? Like, what did I do? I'm so, so confused. And my mom now continues to explain that the assistant principal called her to explain that I was being suspended due to the Snapchat video I had posted ranting about Lisa the previous day. And while I can admit in hindsight that posting my video feelings on Snapchat ranting about Lisa, even though I didn't mention her by name or tag her, was not exactly smart. It just goes to show the power of white women taking a narrative and flipping the script for their own gain. This girl had taken it upon herself to insert herself into situations that were not relevant to her, get up in my face, threaten to get physical with me for actively reacting to being disrespected and assaulted and embarrassed publicly, and then went to go single me out maliciously as the sole um, responsible person for spreading these unsavory rumors about Sammy, even though she knew damn well that other people were in the room and also having that conversation. But she chose to single me out to the principal simply because she did not like me for whatever reason.
And it was such an unfortunate situation because my assistant principal probably knew damn well that I was not going to be on school grounds to defend myself. So Lisa had brought this footage to the assistant principal, instantly turned on the waterworks, complaining and crying that I was being a bully. I had said so many horrible things about her, completely disregarding and admitting what she had been doing to me for almost weeks prior at this point that led to me bubbling over and saying these things about her on social media. My assistant principal completely took her side, did not bother to wait until I got back, or did not bother to go and investigate the situation further. She took it at face value, automatically painted me as the aggressor, ate Lisa's tears up as a white woman herself, and decided to immediately suspend me without giving me a chance to defend myself, without notifying me or looking deeper into the story. Because of Lisa's white woman tears, a white woman who had gone out of her way to attack me and make my life miserable unprovoked was now being absolved of any guilt, responsibility and I was not the one being punished. I was suspended from school for three days and upon my return, she proceeded to avoid me and would not show up to class for days. If that story won't break down to you what the concept of white woman tears are, then I don't know what will. Is the phrase white woman tears racist? Well, that really depends which way you look at it, doesn't it? What is going on with this eyebrow, by the way? So in case you hadn't noticed, I am a white woman. And whenever the BIPOC community mentions white fragility or white women's tears, Mm, it's uncomfortable, not gonna lie. And maybe 10, 15 years ago, I would have said, but that's just as racist. However, I am really lucky that over the last 10, 15 years, I have experienced other cultures and seen things from a different angle. Getting upset is a perfectly valid emotion. If I was accused of racism, I'd probably cry. Maybe because I'm fragile. The problem is, historically, white women take it a step further. They then utilize their tears so that they can play the victim. I can't talk to you right now. <laughs> I'm too upset. How can you talk to me like this? So everyone feels sorry for the poor girl that's crying, who takes no accountability. The blame gets pointed back to the BIPOC community. White women's tears is a weapon. White women crying when they receive any sort of criticism from women of color is fucking racist. Because white women will sit there and use their tears as weapons against women of color to absolve themselves from any sort of guilt, but also to silence women of color. And this white damsel in distress narrative is not only racist, but it is also lethal. White women tears only helps uphold white supremacy. Ugh, I agree. And what's even scarier is imagine if this had been like, I don't know, the 90s or some time when there wouldn't have been so many cameras in a store and all they would have had to go on was her word. And then these poor people would have been locked up forever because she wanted attention on social media for her fake kidnapping story. Play you all more of the video. You're so distracted by um, everything that's going on in the world that we are kind of um, have our guards up so much about um, masks and wanting to keep our children safe that way that we're forgetting the most important way to keep them safe and that is with us um, and to not have them taken. So I'm going to share a story um, in an effort to raise that awareness, but it's I'm not ready. I. This is hard for me. I'm not ready to share this story, but I, I know it's important and I would rather be uncomfortable um, and awkward th and get the message out sooner than wait until I feel composed because um, I don't know if I'll I want to talk about white woman tears or just white tears. I was involved with the show not too long ago and there was this controversy of white production people seeing like things that were perceived as racist and upon addressing it one of the white women involved started crying she felt very guilty and ashamed of what people had heard versus what she meant to say but she might look at that and think okay well how can you help but cry in that moment if you're very embarrassed and ashamed it seems like it's a natural thing to do to cry but i want you to stop and ask yourself if you knew that when people saw you crying for whatever reason if you were certain that it would have the negative effect that people would perceive you even worse, would you still do it? Because although it is an emotional moment and I know it's hard to like fabricate tears from nothing, there comes a time in that where things turn and this is no longer I'm sad that I did something wrong, but it turns into a tactic to get people to feel sorry for you and not perceive you as that bad of a person. When in reality, you really need to be held accountable for the things you said. White women are often dangerous perpetrators of anti-blackness. Many see themselves as exempt from perpetuating violence because of their womanhood. However, many white women use this femininity to cause problems for black individuals. When thinking and talking about white woman tears, Dr. Moya Bailey's Massage Noir Transformed and the essay Mammies, Matriarchs, and Other Controlling Images by Dr. Patricia Hill Collins are helpful reads.
The concept of white woman tears is convoluted because it's layered. One must reflect on the historical context, the racial context, and the gender context, as well as how these three work together to create unique violence against black people. If you are in a situation where you as a white person feel threatened, interrogate that feeling and ask yourself where it's coming from. Are you really being threatened or are you being held accountable and it's uncomfortable? Emotion regulation is anti-racist work. If you cannot regulate your emotions, you don't have the capacity to hear the stories of other people, specifically people of color. It's the first time I'm crying in a press conference. I thought I, you know, you're... As would you like for me to explain to you the function of white woman tears using semiotic theory? I would do it. I would do it anyway. I don't care what you say. So, semiotics is the study of signs and symbols and their use or interpretation. This can include a whole myriad of things. Visual, auditory, what have you. To explain semiotic theory, we first have to explain what a sign is. So, signs and symbols are different. Signs are like a one-to-one. -one. For instance, if I show you a lighter, what I mean is a lighter. If I show you a cookie, what I mean is a cookie. I'm not implying any meaning beyond what it is. It's like saying one equals one. It is what it is. So once you pair a sign with a precise context, then it creates a desired meaning, which then elicits an intended response. And this is one of the basics of how communication works. So again, using the sign of the lighter, if I showed you the lighter, and the context is that you're standing outside of a building with a cigarette in your hand, then in that moment, the desired meaning could be that I'm offering you this lighter. And the intended response from you would be to take it from me and use it. Let's use words to illustrate this, right? So if I say it's sunny outside and the context is that it's warm outside, the sun is shining, you can see light all over my face, then the design meaning of that phrase is me just making an observation. And the response from you might be just nodding, just acknowledging. Here's what white tears does. Let's use the same phrase. If I say to you, it's sunny outside, and we have the same context, it's bright outside, it's warm, the sun is shining down on our faces. I'm still making an observation. But what if you responded by crying? That would be so out of left field, something in this process got mixed up. You can't change the sign because the sign is still a one-to-one. -one. The sun is still the sun. But what people forget is that context is variable depending on experience. Oftentimes, cultural knowledge. So what if I said it was sunny outside, but I'm a traveler, and I didn't know that there's like this 20-year drought where I'm traveling to. But I didn't know that, right? So you crying would make perfect sense in that moment. What White Tears seeks to do is recontextualize the reading of the communication itself. Because everybody saw what happened on that tennis court. There's no pretending that what happened on that court did not happen at all. It was televised. There was an audience. The sign is the sign. Her actions were her actions. But by responding in the way that she is doing, she is calling into question the precise context under which those signs were interpreted. Because while much of the public read her actions, the signs, as racist in the context of that match with Coco Gauff, she has to manipulate the circumstances under which those signs were read. And white privilege itself allows white people to not have the exact or precise cultural context for the things that they are reading. So that when they see her crying, they look for a different context as to why she is crying. And that is White Woman Tears Explained by Semiotic Theory. That was fun. I had fun. When I was in the fourth grade, a white girl slapped me in my face. So I slapped the shit out of her back. So then we get sent to the principal's office. She's in tears, obviously, because she didn't expect me to hit her that hard. And then the principal asked what happened. I said, she slapped me for no reason. So I slapped her back. And he said, well, I could see the huge red hamper on her face, but you look fine. This White Woman Tears trend that has been going around on TikTok recently is, like, really gross. So it is apparently a trend on TikTok at the moment for particularly white women to film videos of themselves pretending to cry and then when the beat drops they suddenly show that they were just faking the entire time. And there have been many POC creators on this app that have already outlined the issues inherent with that and how white women's fragility and victimhood has historically been used to target particularly black men. But the thing is, white women participate in trends like these and then turn around and wonder why people of colour don't trust us and wonder why people of colour have so many criticisms about feminism and white feminism in particular. This is exactly why. Because we participate in trends like this showing no understanding of the context of our actions and their consequences. Historically, white women have always pushed people of colour aside in our activism in order to further our own interests at their expense. We have not shown ourselves to be worthy of trust and this is just another example of that. 
Now, good people, after watching this video, I really want to know your thoughts in the comment section. And of course, talk to us, like this video. And if you're here for the first time, I repeat, please subscribe, share it, and leave us a comment. Tell us what you think. So I want us to look at this topic in two two ways or three ways. Let's start looking at it historically, how it was used, how they were using their tears historically, and in the modern context. I think this is going to help us to understand how the white women are using their tears to weaponize uh, a situation and to put uh, the black person into danger. They're using the tears to grab sympathy from the people around. Let's look at it historically. Historically, in societies structured by the white supremacy, where white supremacy is given power, the tears or distress of a white woman have sometimes been weaponized to uphold racial hierarchies. For instance, during the Jim Crow eras, false accusations by white women often led to severe consequences to our black men, including the lynchings of the black people. This is how powerful the white women's tears were and are today. And they still use that against the black people. Many black people suffered during those days just because a white woman has shed her tears. Even if she was the one who was wrong at that time, a black man or a black woman will have to suffer because the society believes in the white supremacy, acknowledge it, giving it more power. So a white woman has realized that their tears is a weapon and they are using it today to grab attention of the people around. You see how powerful it is. What about in the modern days? In discussions about race and privileges, Tears or emotional distress may shift the focus from the issues at hand. The white woman's tears will shift the focus of what was happening at that time. And it might cause the black person to enter into danger or into problems just because a white woman has shed her tears. This is very powerful. And my black people need to be so much aware of how white women are using their tears to weaponize a situation and to defend themselves. Many argue that uh, this is not always a conscious act. White women may cry because of guilt. You see, they, they cry yes because of guilt, a discomfort, or shame during discussions about race. If they cannot defend themselves through the words from their mouth, they will automatically cry. And when they cry, the other party will come to their defense. Because the societal response often prioritizes their emotions. We are the people who give the white supremacy power to control us because we sympathize with something that doesn't need to be sympathized with. They express their emotions to take advantage over the group that is already marginalized. That is how dangerous it is. So our people need to be so much careful. Now, we need to learn on how we can defend ourselves or run away from the white woman's tears because we now know that it is a deadly weapon that is used against us. And therefore, how can we keep off their tears? How can we keep off this weapon? Number one, stay grounded in the purpose of the conversation. If you're discussing something, please stay put. Do not change or start deviating from the discussion. If someone's tears shift the focus away from the topic, gently redirect the discussion. For example, I hear that this is difficult for you, but I'd like us to focus on the issue we are discussing at hand. Always be soft. Use languages that acknowledge emotions without allowing them to dominate the conversation. Do not allow them to dominate the conversation, but use languages that are gonna um, are going to acknowledge the emotions. Number two, cultivate empathy while setting boundaries. Validate emotions to an extent, but ensure they don't overshadow the purpose. For example, it's okay to feel emotional about this. These are tough topics. However, let's make sure we stay on track. Express compassion without taking on the burden of managing their feelings. Number three, be prepared to address deflations. Call it out respectfully. If the tears derail the conversation, you can gently name 
the dynamic. For example, sometimes when emotions come up in these discussions, the focus can shift. Let's be mindful to keep the spotlight on the issues at hand to avoid landing into problems of the white, white woman's tear because they use it as a weapon. Stay calm. Do not overreact. Avoid escalating the situations as anger or frustrations can reinforce offensive reactions. Use clear and neutral communications. Avoid languages that might seem accusatory as it can lead to defensiveness. Use I statements to express your respectives. I feel it is important that we focus on the understanding the larger issue rather than getting caught up in emotions. What about number five? Build a collective understanding. It is a recurring issue in a particular settings, e.g. workspaces or group. Encourage mutual learning to minimize future disruptions. Always work with people. Always work with allies. If possible, work with others in the space who can uh, help redirect the conversations or support you in ensuring that the focus remains on the topic that you people were discussing at that time. Always stay put on the topic of discussion and work with the people around you. Make sure that there are people that can support you. Know when to step back. Stepping back is not a defeat. Always learn to step back. Do not argue to win an argument. If you ever stay on the dancing floor, you might forget some dancing steps. If the situation becomes emotionally toxic, it's okay to pause the conversation. By that, you shall have taken appropriate step. Number eight, which is the last one or the last defense tool, prioritize self self care. Prioritize your self care. Always be safe. Protect your energy and emotional well being. Not every situation requires your intervention. Do not intervene in everything. And it is okay to step away if the dynamics feels unproductive or draining. It's good to step away because staying away or stepping back doesn't mean a defeat. I think we are learning something, guys. If you're here for the first time, guys, I will request that you subscribe to this channel because we still have got a lot more to discuss to help our black people to stay safe outside there in case they land into problems like this of a white woman's tear. They know how they can run away from them. And uh, it is good to always be safe in each and every conversation so that we don't land into problems of these people because they trick us in all corners. White supremacy is still a thing in the society. So it will be there. So we must learn on how we can also play with their brains because they want black people, not because they were very powerful, but because they used their common sense. They never used deadly weapons. The war that they won is the mental war, not a physical war. So if we can also engage with them in a mental war, we're going to have a good fight back. And this is going to help our people run away from traps, that are put there to make us land into problems. Thank you guys for watching this video and let's have another meeting in my next discussion.